refrigerant. And um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting experience because I've been working with CO2 as a refrigerant for a long time. And anything that is important for CO2 as a refrigerant doesn't matter when you take water as a refrigerant because you have very low pressures. I mean, you all know that uh, water is evaporating at 100 degrees C when you are boiling uh, water on a, on a stove. And uh, when you go to vacuum, you can actually do minus temp not minus temperature, sorry, but you can actually go below 110 degrees C. And, uh, and this is what we're doing, actually. So I'm just taking you through the next two minutes through something where many people will say that is possibly not possible, but uh, we did it anyway. Um, so if we go to the next slide, Julia, however that works. Mm. Uh, you can you can do it by yourself, um, but I can also do it. I did it. You. I think I did it. It just was slowly. Um, we just heard from from Julia that there there is a, a lot of uh, things going on regarding energy efficiency, and there is also a lot going on uh, about the reduction of CO2 equivalent reduction of uh, refrigerants um, over the next years. And I don't want to repeat this because it was very. Uh, comprehensive what what Julia told us so basically this slide is just telling the same thing in a nutshell and um, if we come to the next slide then um, there is a lot of refrigeration technologies that are possible and um, it is also a lot of not in kind technologies, so to say, where people sometimes get confused about what is makeable and what is not makeable. And to me, the reverse ranking cycle, which is the refrigeration process, as everybody has it at home, it's in, in the kitchen uh, with the compression, which is on the right side, the red uh, bubble, and then the condensation, the expansion, the evaporation, where you basically take the cooling. Uh, that's that's still the process which is most, um, let's say, realistic to be used in future as well. The question then just is which refrigerants should we use to actually make uh, the process running? And um, and there, um, the thing is that the uh, now I have to try to change slides again. somewhat slowly, um, there is this periodic table of elements, which, uh, the, the, which hasn't changed uh, over the last years. And I think it will not change in the future. I mean, some people are afraid of this table. But on the other hand, you can say, um, now that we have this toolbox, only eight elements are suitable to, use, to be used uh, to build molecules which behave as refrigerants. So, um, nobody should get confused when the chemical industry says they have new refrigerant options and there are coming new solutions and so on. Um, they, they, they cannot use anything else uh, which is not available from this table of elements. And the thing is, the more you go to the left, like C and H hydrocarbons, the more flammable it gets. I mean, it would be a shame if hydrocarbons wouldn't burn because then we wouldn't be able to do barbecue and stuff. And if you go down, things get more toxic. So um, that's why in the beginning, uh, in the 30s, 1930s, people went to CFCs, um, which was like carbon, fluorine, and chlorine. And um, that, that, of course, had the problem with the ozone depletion. Then the chlorine was out. Now we talk about global warming. So now we go to HFOs, which are oxygen, fluorine, carbon, and a little bit of uh, hydrogen. And then the, the compromise is only to say, how flammable do we want to get a fluid and what do we accept? But you can definitely say, uh, or that's for sure, there will be no other solution than what we see today um, and all the rest is more or less politics more, or, or let's say lobbying. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, that means that if you look at the refrigerants and ozone depletion, then we have the Montreal Protocol, which is in place. And um, that requires ozone depletion potential zero, which means we are on the axis um, where ODC, uh, ODP is zero. And then the next question is how far do we want to go down in global warming potential? And um, the refrigerants that are promoted today and Daikin just went away from 32, which is pretty far down on this axis. Uh, all the other refrigerants on this axis, and this is a chart I made about, about like 20 years ago, which, which is still valid. Uh, all the other refrigerants, they will more, more or less disappear over the years. So you end up with these refrigerants down there uh, in the green bubble where there is isobutane, propane, ammonia, water, and then uh, CO2. And this is uh, the refrigerant family that we that we call the double zero. So it's also the uh, ozone depletion potential zero and then also GWP zero. Well, hydrocarbons, they got something like three, but it's still okay, I would say. And so the next question would be, what makes a good refrigerant? Well, there you have to think about, uh, if you think about your kids, what, what is a good kid? I mean, if the kid steals and kills people, it's probably not so very compliable with, uh, with um, let's say, the expectations of uh, the society. And the point number two under chemical properties, flammability, is a showstopper if you go to countries um, where handling of flammable refrigerants is a bit difficult. I mean, I, I like very much the approach of FISMA, no, no doubt. And uh, I also have only fridges at home which have flammable refrigerants. So that's a good approach. But in some countries, um, now I think of the US, uh, where they have too many lawyers and where you can get money for uh, getting people burned when you sell hot coffee, then this can be a showstopper. And then one of these properties can be enough to say it's not a good refrigerant. And, and there, of course, water has no problem, at least regarding the point of flammability. And what we did with water um, as a refrigerant, it, it's really tap water. I mean, you just buy the system dry and you install it and you charge it with uh, tap water on the, um, on the location where you're sitting. Um, is that you can, after the uh, commissioning, you run the system and decommissioning or servicing means you can drain the water down uh, the drain water tab or you can just drink it. It doesn't really matter. And if I said we talk about different applications or if the title is different applications, then of course there is a limitation below zero degrees C somewhat, because then you don't need uh, tubes, but you need conveyor belts for um, the water uh, as they get ice cubes. So what you can see on the right hand side, the Echilla uh, application range is mainly addressing IT cooling. So that means server cooling. It's comfort cooling. It's not so much air conditioning due to humidification. It is uh, cabinet, switch, cat cab uh, switch cabinet cooling, and it is industrial refrigeration. So that means like plastic molding and stuff like that. And uh, we try to stay above temperatures about like 20, well, let's say we start from 12, 15 degrees like that, and, and then not to, to go too far down because of the vapor curve of water. But if there are questions to that, we can we can take that later. And then a very interesting application on the left side of the chart is to actually use water as a refrigerant together with other refrigerants like CO2 or hydrocarbons, and this in a cascade. Because if, if, if we use, for example, a CO2 system, and we have heard that in the presentation before, uh, the efficiency goes down if the temperature outside goes up. And if, if we put a cascade together with water up to 100 degrees C, everything is in vacuum anyway. So hot climates are no worry. And uh, we can definitely, I mean, this machine never goes on a high pressure failure wherever we are on this globe uh, or the earth. 
And, and this means we can give Norwegian climate to the entire world and the CO2 system standing somewhere in the Middle East would just say, well, hmm, it's just standing in Norway. So that's a very, very interesting combination of two, uh, two natural refrigerants, CO2 and water. And um, in the worst case, if you've got a cascade with a brace plate heat exchanger between water and CO2, um, it never gets worse in the case of the failure of the heat exchanger. It never gets worse than that you got sparkling water instead of water. But that's it. So what we did is, uh, as one of the examples, uh, we installed a system in 2014, which is like, hmm, after all, five years ago, more or less, um, in a in a server room in, in in Bremen, which is in the north of Germany, and they had a cooling capacity with the servers you can see here uh, of about 25 kilowatt. They had a double floor um, indicated by the grid in the bottom, and this is the cold aisle, and they wanted to maintain 25 degrees C, and the outside temperature in Bremen varies, I'll come back to that a little later, maximum up to 30. So you have a lot of free cooling time and the server they that just took the air and blew it on the other side, which is the warm aisle, and there was about like 35. So what you can see here is in the beginning in 2014, this is the years 2015, 16, 17, and 18, um, they had a redundant system which was a 410A system, uh, the red one, and then 718 is the number for water as a refrigerant. They had the water system as well, and then a normal redundant system. That means both refrigeration systems were big enough to, uh, let's say, supply or to, to fulfill the task and supply the full cooling capacity. And then the first month, they run both systems as you normally run redundant systems. So that means you want to get them equally quickly old or at least used. And then from September, which is indicated by the first nine uh, on, the, on the bottom axis, then we said, well, you can just give us more, more um, capacity and then you will save more money. And if you look uh, along the line, then the, the, the bars shown there, they get more and more blue, meaning they use basically only our system, uh, the, CO, uh, the water system, sorry. And um, then they uh, use the, the one, uh, the, the, the 410A system more or less only as a backup. And if you look at the year 2017, then we had an annual efficiency of 24, the COP24, which means you get 24 kilowatt refrigeration capacity out of one kilowatt uh, electricity used. And um, this is something where some people say to us, well, that's not possible because it's breaking thermodynamic laws. And I uh, invite you very much to look at how we do it and how it actually works and why we achieved this large number, but uh, it has been proven over the last three years in this application that it actually worked, and uh, also with this efficiency. And the Fortin A system had an annual COP in average of about four, which is a number that people from refrigeration know as a, I would just say as a state of the art average COP over an entire year. And that, mean, uh, that meant in the end that if you compare the two systems, the water system, the 718 versus the 410A, um, then the electricity savings were worth about like 8,500 euro per year at the price of 21 cent per euro, uh, per kilowatt hour. And then uh, the CO2 savings, which is for the world, of course, was even more in interesting. They were about like 21 tons uh, with the uh, CO2 mix we have in Germany, 
or if you go to the States, it would even have been uh, 25,000 tons of uh, CO2 in one year. And uh, for these people that have no idea what, what that means, it's like driving a, a BMW uh, 320 diesel, which we shouldn't do anymore anyway, <laughs> uh, is about worth, uh, it's about worth like 200,000 kilometers or 12,400 miles um, of, um, of, of driving uh, with such a car. So that I think is very impressive numbers um, where the energy efficiency plus the effect that you don't have HFCs or F gases as refrigerants really matter. And so what we see today, <clears throat> that's a picture I like very much, is that if you look at um, New York in Easter 2019, then there was only one car on the street and all the rest was horses. I mean, for the guys that make the horseshoes, it's probably a bad story. But within 14 years, or 13 even, there was only one horse left and all the rest were cars. I mean, it's about changing technologies and, and just using um, what is possible today um, <clears throat> and, um, and, and through new ideas um, to write somewhat, in our case, refrigeration history. And that's what the day today is about. So uh, anybody is invited to, to, to learn more about this story. And uh, what we've done so far is we've made 170 machines about. Uh, we have 60, 70 out in the field. Um, many months, more than a thousand actually, uh, of experience uh, with running these machines in different applications and typically it's uh, industrial applications. So it's not comfort cooling or something where people say, well, today it's a bit warmer, but it's really uh, industrial processes where there's a lot of, let's say, processes behind that have to be maintained and work. And uh, then, of course, you can, out of these machines installed in the market, transfer to uh, electricity cost savings, uh, which is not only cost, but uh, definitely also CO2 equivalent savings uh, with the electricity um, emissions, or let's say CO2 equivalent emissions you have, so the indirect emissions of the systems. And um, then again, uh, what said you? What Julia said before? There were no. It's it's a technology that is let's say mature enough to, to just be installed and used, and this is also the reason why we have uh, let's say a lot of water um, to drink, and uh, we like it very much as a refrigerant. And there's a lot of global representation, um, and uh, this the this, this, this systems can be visited, let's say, at least around Europe without problems. And the guy talking to you at the moment is the one to the very left up there or in the middle, uh, standing next to the machine. And with that, I have uh, used more or less the 10 minutes I was given. And uh, it's all about water as a refrigerant. And at the same time, it's brick uh, energy savings. And if there are any questions, I'm uh, very willing to take them. Thank you. Yeah, 